Thanks for tuning in to Reporting the Arizona Sonora Connection. My colleague Kendall Blessed and I are excited to share a little bit about KJZZ's Hermosillo Bureau here in the Sonoran capital. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm Murphy Woodhouse, of course. I was born and raised in the Intermountain West, uh, born in Wyoming, and then raised mostly in Idaho. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Montana in Missoula. Got a degree in journalism with minors in uh, Spanish and Latin American studies. Uh, and then I uh, took a, a professional detour and did three years of wildfire in the American West before returning to graduate school at the University of Arizona's Center for Latin American Studies, uh, where I focused on immigration enforcement and deportation and did field work in Guatemala. Uh, when I finished there in the spring of 2014, I got my first full-time journalism job at the Nogales International uh, in, on the border in Nogales, Arizona. And then after two years there, I moved to the Daily Star, uh, where I was the county reporter as well as the roadrunner columnist. And then after two years there, moved on to KJZZ. And I'm Kendall Blessed, the other half of the Hermosillo Bureau. I'm from Arizona, born and raised in Tucson. So being here in Sonora feels very close to home for me, just a few hours drive from my family, which is nice. I didn't study journalism as an undergrad. And after college, I spent several years traveling, working with nonprofit organizations, and then as a teacher before I decided to go back to school to study journalism. I graduated from the University of Arizona J School in 2016, and actually my first full-time journalism job was also at the Nogales International. I started working there when Murphy took his job at the Arizona Daily Star, and now a couple years later, we're colleagues at the Hermosillo Bureau. And then just a little background on, on, our, on our station as well as the, the Bureau. So, so KJZZ is, of course, the, the Phoenix NPR member station uh, and is a service of the Rio Salado College, uh, which itself is a part of the Maricopa Community College's system. And uh, there in that picture, that's actually Rio Salado President, interim Rio Salado President Kate Smith uh, checking out our sound booth here in Hermosillo last year. And the Bureau here in Hermosillo is actually the second that KJZZ uh, 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 one of two that KJZZ operates in Mexico. The Mexico City Bureau started up a few years before us, and uh, both of those are, are unique for NPR affiliate stations. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't another uh, member station that actually operates foreign bureaus. And uh, we just celebrated our two-year anniversary on June 7th. We're very proud of that. And over those two years, two years plus now, uh, we've covered hundreds of stories and, and really traveled the width and breadth of, of this wonderful and fascinating state. Our basic mission here is to cover the numerous connections between Arizona and Sonora. And, and a, a major focus, uh, probably our principal focus, is the massive economic relationship between the two states. Uh, but our coverage has really included a, a broad range of topics in northwestern Mexico of interest to Arizona listeners. And our home here in Hermosillo is actually at the Universidad Tecnológica de Hermosillo, the, the technological university here and they have just been tremendous hosts and have done a great deal to make to make our work here possible. So before we get into some of the specifics about our reporting from Hermosillo, we thought it would be a good idea just to give you a sense of what it's like to be the first reporters at a new international bureau. Murphy and I both speak Spanish. We've reported on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, and we've both lived outside of the United States before, but we were pretty new to Hermosillo when we got here. I, for one, had only spent time here on trips to and from San Carlos, stopping over on the way to the beach. Um, and we both come from print backgrounds or newspaper jobs, and so we were new to radio. And there was a learning curve as we got settled in and gained more experience with the technical side of our jobs. And I would say we both now really enjoy the sound aspect and audio production. And we also had to start building our network of sources. So we spent a lot of time early on going to meetings with people in the community, in government, in business, and just trying to get a hold of phone numbers and business cards of people who would be helpful to get in touch with for stories and interviews later on. But Murphy and I were actually recently talking about this, and we both feel like we have learned the most about our jobs and really established our strongest connections just through the process of reporting our stories. And now we really do have a strong network of people to turn to uh, as sources, but we're always still looking for new ideas. So I'll just put out a plug that if you would like to share an idea with us, please reach out and we'll provide our contact information at the end of the presentation. Uh, but with that, we thought we'd share a few highlights of the work we've done so far. 
So as I, I mentioned before, binational trade is, is one of our key areas of, of focus. Um, and, and that trade is, is just massive. Last year, uh, roughly $17.5 billion in combined imports and exports between Arizona and Mexico. And uh, Mexico is, is Arizona's most important trading partner. Uh, something that I've done a lot of work on is the Mexican produce export business. And uh, though it's a, a small town in a lot of ways, Nogales, Arizona is, is actually the crossing point for uh, a really tremendous portion of the fresh fruits and vegetables uh, that you find on grocery store shelves in the United States. Uh, and in terms of value, the tomato is, is one of the most, if not the most important commodities. Um, I've reported on a, a years-long dispute between domestic and Mexican tomato growers, one that's at a standstill for now, but very much could open back up, even with the new USMCA trade deal uh, in effect. And here's a clip from a story I did about a tomato farm in southern Sonora. Mira, este, yo tengo una anécdota muy bonita de, 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 aparte de los tomates. Hecho Huaquila first came to prominence as the hometown of famed lefty Dodgers pitcher Fernando Valenzuela. It was known for baseball, but now has made a name for itself with tomatoes. Es un pueblito de éxito, que la gente le gusta trabajar. This is a successful little town, he says, whose people like to work. But while those tomatoes are a source of pride for Luna, some U.S. growers see them and the several billion other pounds imported annually as an existential threat. One of the areas I've focused a lot of reporting on has been binational conservation. I learned really quickly that conservation efforts I knew about in Arizona and north of the border are strongly tied to what's happening here in Sonora and Mexico. And there are so many groups that work across the border to protect species and habitats that are important on both sides. And my first introduction to that was really with the vaquita marina, which is a, a little porpoise with an adorable face that is unfortunately the world's most endangered marine mammal. It lives just south of the Arizona border in the north, northernmost part of the Sea of Cortez. Scientists estimate there are only about 10 vaquita left. So in 2018, I reported a three-part series about the vaquita. Here's a clip from a section focused on the tensions between the livelihoods of fishermen and protection of the vaquita. A group of fishermen take off from the docks in San Felipe, Baja California. Their blue and white fishing boats bounce and rattle out into the waves of Mexico's Sea of Cortez. We have to take care of her, the Vaquita Marina, says Ruben Orozco. He's a 68-year-old fisherman wearing a Chicago Bulls baseball cap and a gray paint-stained sweatshirt. He spent his entire life on the water, living next to the endangered Vaquita Porpoise. He's among a group of fishermen working to remove illegal and abandoned fishing nets from the ocean. Until a few years ago, they would have been the ones casting nets. I've also done reporting about jaguars and how their potential to reestablish a breeding population in the U.S. depends on conservation work in Mexico. And I recently reported a story about the ways budget cuts to Mexico's environmental agencies impacts conservation efforts in Arizona. Uh, you know, our reporting is focused on the ties between Arizona and Sonora. And I think the connections we see in the natural world are one really clear example of that. Uh, and as, as I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, Mexico has been going through some of its most violent years on, on record recently. Uh, Sonora is certainly no exception to that. And in fact, has seen some of uh, the most alarming increases in, in especially murders uh, in the country. So Ken and I, we, we try to be judicious about when we cover individual violent events, uh, but we've also tried to do reporting that puts that violence in context, explores the factors at play, as well as the strategies, or, or in some cases, the lack thereof, to address it. And earlier this year, uh, we did a three-part series on, on violence in Sonora. I analyzed federal crime data and spoke with high-ranking state security officials, as well as those directly impacted by rising murder. And here I'd like to share a clip uh, from my interview with Sonora's state attorney. The Mexican criminal justice group in Punidad Cero calculated a murder impunity rate of roughly 78% for Sonora, which was one of the lower rates in Mexico. Respecto del año pasado, nosotros obtuvimos 256 sentencias condenatorias. Responding to Cooley's comments, State Attorney Claudia Indira Contreras says her office got over 250 successful murder convictions last year and issued over a thousand arrest warrants, many for murder. Indira also pushed back on the impunity figure, but acknowledged that her office has yet to resolve a majority of cases. 
And for her parts of the story, uh, Kendall did some really in-depth reporting on the challenges faced by law enforcement here in Sonora. That includes brazen attacks against officers, uh, corruption and low pay among the ranks, as well as low morale and a number of other challenges. Uh, she also looked at extreme violence against women, uh, which uh, has tragically been increasing along with uh, murder in general in the state. And I think just as important, uh, she also reported on, on a, a vibrant and powerful women's, uh, women's movement that's been demanding justice for the victims of that violence. As reporters in the borderlands, we also couldn't end this presentation without touching on the, the topic of migration. And the first thing I want to mention is the Fronteras Desk series, Tracing the Migrant Journey. Last fall, Murphy and I, along with all of our Fronteras Desk colleagues, seven of us in total, worked on this project reporting stories in four countries from Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States to give more context and nuance to what the migration journey looks like for some, what it looked like at that time specifically. And for this story, I went to Guadalajara, which had become something of a hub for migrants and asylum seekers who for various reasons were considering staying in Mexico, many applying for asylum in Mexico rather than continue to the US. Here's just one clip from that reporting. While Dana Costa left Honduras together with her husband and two children for the United States, but she says she got separated from them along the journey and the kids were taken from her husband in Guadalajara because he's not their biological father or legal guardian. Acosta says her family still hopes to reach the United States, but she's terrified about the possibility of having her children taken from her again north of the border. A human rights worker helping Acosta says this is the first case of family separation she's aware of in Guadalajara, but with increasing immigration enforcement in Mexico, family separation is becoming a growing issue. For this same series, Murphy reported at the border in San Luis Rio Colorado, and our series has been submitted for several awards uh, one of which we recently won two Murrow Awards collectively for this project. And of course, our reporting also tries to keep up with what changing policies in both the U.S. and Mexico mean for migrants here south of the border, and more recently, what is happening to migration and asylum during the coronavirus pandemic. And so, uh, you know, serious topics like 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 those are, are a really important part of our coverage down here and, and uh, and we're, and we're proud of a lot of the work that we've done um, along those lines. But, but we also do a lot of reporting on just the fascinating people and places here in Sonora. Uh, one, of, one of my favorites in that vein uh, was a trip I took to San Pedro de la Cueva, which is on the edge of the massive El Novio Reservoir in uh, central Sonora. Uh, it's been a relatively unknown bass angler's paradise for decades, and a number of Arizonans and other U.S. residents live there part-time. And I had the tremendous pleasure uh, to get to know one of them, uh, Gary Chitwood of Payson, Arizona. Let's, let's give him a listen. At the southern end of the lake the next day, the water was much clearer. That and a switch to an unlikely lure brought the hope for change in luck, at least for Gary. Got him. Here's a good fish. They came one. Got him. Good fish. Right after the other. We seem to have found something that works. Five inch lizards, what's working? Black seems to be the color. Also on something of the lighter side, I wanted to share some reporting I've done on the traditional Sonoran agave spirit, Bacanora. One of my very first stories from Hermosillo was a two-part series on how the Bacanora industry is dealing with modernization. A lot of producers are trying to enter the international market, but they also want to preserve the rich history of this traditional spirit. And it's an ongoing process right now um, that's been really fascinating to follow. So this March, I did a follow-up story about women who are taking a more active role in the Bacanora industry as it's changing. And here is a clip from that story. Espinosa says women have always been part of the Bacanora making process. Their roles just weren't visible. The wife, the sisters, aunts, they're all helping the Maestro Escalero in this activity. Now, women's roles have expanded. They work in the agricultural sector growing agave, in marketing and distribution, and many own their own brands. 
but it's been hard to change perceptions. She says, for many men, the first question that came to their minds was, are you the wife of the producers? Because they don't imagine women doing Bacanora. Our answer was straight out, no, we are the owners, we are the women that did these brands. And slowly, minds are changing, as women like Alejandra Peñanuri are taking the helm. All right, thank you so much for spending this time with us here today. We're really looking forward to the question and answer portion of this presentation that's on Friday, July 17th at 2 p.m. And in the meantime, we'll leave you with the link to our reporting from the Hermosillo Bureau, which is at kjzz.org slash Hermosillo, as well as our email addresses and Twitter handles. So if you would like to reach out to us, please feel free. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks again for tuning into our presentation.